had the opportunity a couple of days ago to sit down with Kevin Costner. And, uh, of course, Bull Durham, JFK, The Untouchables, uh, Field of Dreams. And he came into the New York City Man Cave. And uh, we talked about a variety of things. But we started the interview with a bit of an awkward greeting to one another. Great to see you. Looking good. Thank you. We did have, I don't know if it was an awkward moment, but I wasn't sure if I was supposed to maybe give you a handshake or I was going to give you a, 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 a hug or a handshake yeah. hug. Do you understand what I, the... Yeah, I understand that there's a lot of greetings out there these days. And, and, uh, and, and you know, the perfect examples are on television. But I don't know. I stuck my hand out and... And I, I got a feeling like you're a, a handshake guy, too. And you just have to kind of go along with this uh, this club that's ever going on. But, but I deal with young athletes, you know, yeah. and they, it's, they're not doing a firm handshake. No. So I no. got to do like a hug and then they bring you in and yeah. then pat you on the back a couple times. It's not a good start. It's not a good start. But, uh, you know, you got once you get by, whatever it's going to be. We're too old, though. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Yeah, good, good point. Are we too old? Jesus Christ. I am. You're not. Hey, what sport could you play right now that you would actually feel comfortable doing? Well, you know, I, I can't play basketball anymore. And the reason I say that is because I can't guard anybody because of the knees. And if you can't guard somebody, you can't say you play basketball. You oh. can go out and shoot. Oh, wait a minute. Wait you a minute. Shoot. You, just, you just took a shot at me, though. I, even when I knees were good, I, yeah. I didn't guard anybody. Well, you, you, well, you maybe didn't guard them, but you tried to guard them. But that's how kind of I, I gauge that. I go, you know, now I can just shoot, shoot around. And you go, do you play basketball? No, I don't. Because... You shoot. That's you, it. Yeah, you shoot. You don't do don't do the other stuff. But, um, you know, the the knees have, have have taken it away. But if you look at when you played baseball with Bull Durham or it's yeah. Tin Cup, like which one do you look at? Because trying to convince people that you could do this or you're real is is part of the battle. I think when it comes to sports, that the yeah. audience believes that you're. Capable because well, you have to, yeah, you have to make that up in your mind. I mean, you either have respect for sport or not. And 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 you know, you know, even Olivier, if he couldn't play, he might have been the greatest actor ever. But if you can't hit a ball, you can't outact it. There's a one thing in movies you can't do. And so, like, I would never do a hockey movie because I don't know how to skate. And there's so many people that think they can automatically play sports. And even a non-athlete can recognize in a second somebody who can't play. And it bothers me. It bothers you. It bothers yeah. everybody in the room. You say, "Man, you know, you, there's a motion. There's a belayic move that is so obvious, and it's the little things that even come in between swing and the bat. It's just how you move." Did you believe Redford when he played baseball? He can play a little bit, but um, uh, he's 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 athletic. He's coordinated. You can see it. Uh, you know, and so he had the he had the moves. What's the movie, sports movie, that hasn't been told yet? That I don't know if there is one that you have. You know, I, ha I had this thought about a you know a, a, a basketball uh, you know coach idea where you know he's just getting beat the hell out of, of the, the of the color announcer who wants his job. The you know the the, the everybody the towns after him that he can't get the athletes to play, and then the and then the owner brings in some girl that was on Time Magazine because she turns companies around psychologically, and he thinks, my team sucks, and she brings her in. And so it's I, I, you just have the whole town bearing down on you, and now I've got a, a, a psychologist, and I mean, I was thinking call, we called it basket cases, but we never wrote it. But I don't know. Um, they're hard to do. They're like Western sports movies. The, people think that there's black hat, white hat, that just should be pretty easy, thinking like sports, so oh, that's a great story. But the, the reality is a great story uh, doesn't make a great movie. A great script does. And the distilling a story down to um, the way Shelton did, a guy ironing clothes and the broad comes in, and really understanding that, and understanding that a guy's willing to go hit a home run in obscurity just because the, even though he knows it's a bull record, in a way, because it's minor league, he yeah. can't ever find himself talking about it in a bar. He, he elects to still room with an 18-year-old, and he goes and he hits that last home run because it means something to him. And there's this level of poetry that comes with sports inside all the vulgarity and all the insanity that is. 
But you couldn't do a sequel where Crash is a manager and you and Susan. I could if, if I could if Ron uh, if Ron wrapped his arms around it and, and got it to that point where he thought it was good and I thought it was good. I, I'll do a sequel. It hasn't been a part of my career makeup. Yeah. But if you can get to that second movie and not, you know, a lot of times now in movies, you see these sequels and then or the, the sequel comes after a movie you maybe like, and it's not very good. And then they kind of go. You know, we really apologize for that second one. We're going to make a third one. <laughs> and, and you just realize they're just backing that truck in, seeing how big a shovel they can get, and throwing the money at it. Now, it's a really... But, but just think about how many times you hear, I apologize for that second one. You know what? I, it's like, really? You know, so it's a, it's a pretty good business, the apology business. Did you buy a Newman in Slapshot? Uh, he could skate. He could skate. And, you know, Paul could deliver a line. And he played the elder guy. And, you know, uh, but, you know, Pier, you know, Jimmy Pearsall's story, we didn't buy We didn't buy him going up on the fence. And you see it. And listen, you can't always get it perfect. I mean, we made a, a pretty perfect movie in Field of Dreams. But Shoeless Joe is throws left. Yeah. And, and, he, and he hits left. And I knew I was going to take the bullets for that. You know, and I said to the director who was – really wrote a piece of a lifetime. You know, I'm, I'm the one that's going to take a beating for this. Like, why didn't you stop that? You know what I mean? From So like, Ray Liotta is... Now, did Ray know, too, that this is what should have been asked of him to be Shoeless I, Joe? At a certain moment, I just didn't say anything. That, that would have just, oh, okay. just messed with him, yeah. you know, in a, in, a, in a real way. But, you know, the treat on that movie was working with Lancaster. Burt I mean, Lancaster. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? This is the guy that ran across that water in that Kentuckian, you know, and fought with Walter. I actually said, <laughs> I actually said, we're sitting next to each other. I said, you know, that shot across the water. Cause you saw that. <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, can I tell you how I did it? I go, yeah. And he said, first off, I ran to where the guy was shooting. And I told the director, I'm going to run as fast as I can. I want him to load. And when he's done loading, I want you to tell me to stop when I run. And that way I'll know where I'm going to start. And this is where I'll be hiding. And this is where I'll go. So you saw that? It was, That's was, a good imitation. He was, I don't know how good <laughs> imitation was, but what was really maybe the best part of the imitation was, you saw that? Because <laughs> he loved the details of what he did. And, uh, you know, and I said that fight with Mathaw was amazing. You know, that whip and that woman rolls the thing over. The, and it was like, you know, we were suddenly the same animal on the Serengeti. Him and I started talking, you know. Yeah. We had suddenly bridged that thing that it was only him and I could talk. He's Kevin Costner joining us here in the man cave. What do people say on the streets when you're in New York? Well, the good thing is I never know what they're going to say when it comes to a movie. And I'm kind of glad my career hasn't drilled down to a single movie. It, their movies have a chance to, to affect people in different ways. And so, you know, I, it's, it, it rotates between about 10, 12 movies that somebody will come up and say, that was my movie. That was my movie. And I, I think I'm kind of happiest about that. But is there, because you'd have to do this retrospective, it feels like, when people do interviews with you. Because yeah. I, I, I'm curious about certain things that you've done. But also, I, what was your life like at the peak of your success? The, uh, well, I thought I was happening before I was happening. And after I was happening, I didn't think much about it. And now when you go, what, what, let's go find that peak. Um, was it crazy? It wasn't crazy for me because it didn't happen for me at 19 and 20. My first check came in at about 28 years old. So I didn't have my head out of a, out of a limousine going down Sunset doing cocaine on the hood. I was, like, anxious to do my next movie. And when people said, well, your fifth movie in, you direct it. Aren't you think you're going a little fast? I said, man, I've been waiting a long time. Yeah. I've been watching. I was a stage manager for three years, watching all the cameras, doing all the stuff, making $3.24 an hour, I think. And I was watching. So for them, it was like a fast jump. And for me, I had been moving that direction all the time. Did you have acting heroes or sports heroes? Uh, I had both. I really had both. But there. did you aspire to be an athlete yes. first? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. I, I, you know, Brock was somebody that I... Uh, Lou Brock? Yeah, was somebody that I re really, really liked. And how he played, how he, how he hit. And, you know, I've seen so many... You know, when I see all this slow motion stuff now that still makes guys in the room cry, makes me cry if that voice comes up 
Sable and, and all those different people that would talk, you know. Uh, I think I saw all those games. I mean, I saw, I saw OJ play Namath in the preseason game because I wanted to see the Heisman Trophy winner play against a Super Bowl champion. And, you know, there was only like one game a week, like on yeah. CBS. And so I have watched the games faithfully for 30, 40 years. It just, I just do. What is, uh, is there a comparison between be, uh, being an athlete and being an actor? Well, I direct like a coach. Sometimes when I'm doing an action scene and, you know, and I start talking to the guys, I can see them start doing this. Like, you know, there's a lot of these chin boogie things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And really, it's not that they understand. They're actually nervous. They're saying, quit talking to me. Don't talk to me. <laughs> and then when I do the scene and the bombs go off or something goes off and I think, where were you, man? Well, I thought, I go, what do you mean? You were going like this to me. You were going like this to me. Where were you? Now we got to do this all over again. A long time ago, I just brought out a chalkboard. I said, look, you got to be here when this is, okay? If, if I come here, are you going to come out? No, good. When you see me, that's when you're coming out. And I found that with a chalkboard, um, I, I can actually get a lot done. And, um, but you, you know, mess with an actor on a hot streak. You know, they, there's the scene in Bull Durham. You know, you, you don't mess with yeah. somebody on a hot streak. But if, if an actor is in the zone, you don't, do you know it and don't talk to him? Yeah, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to say anything unless you feel like you have this pride of authorship. You know, it's like when I had Duvall and, you know, I, I, I knew the lines would work for him and I didn't feel the need to, to say anything unless I needed to move him somewhere. And I never hesitated with that. But, you know, I mean... Um, some guys really know how to turn a line. They just know how to do it. Um, trying to think, you know, when, when you, um, you, get, you deep dive into sports, but I think we get confused that sports movies are about sports when they're, it's all about a relationship. Yeah. Isn't it? They're the, back, they're the backdrop. They're the big, they're the big thing. Because without you and Susan Sarandon and Bull Durham, like that relationship is what it's about. It's not about baseball. Yeah, if it's about baseball, then it just becomes a documentary, and that's okay. That's a, that's a different animal. But movies are always, the best ones are at least going to be about men and women and why they can or cannot get along and why they, regardless of that, why they have to be together. I still love that you have all the scenes with her, the great scenes with Sarandon and Bull Durham. And meanwhile, she's fallen in love with Tim Robbins on the movie set, and you don't even know it. No, I don't know. And I, I think you probably picked that up. And I think I was like, I'm like some dodo out there, you know. Would I'm you like, have acted differently if you knew that they were in love? <laughs> no. That I, bathtub scene would have been... No, I, I wouldn't. But I tell you what, when you when you make that leap with your, your co-star... You're, you don't. You no longer have the leverage to say if you think things are falling apart. Hey, I need a better effort out of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they yeah. go, "Oh, really?" Yeah. You know, you know. So you kind of lose that kind of little high ground of like, let's take care of this movie because we're going to be here every day. And like, if we really do, then we'll probably get together after the movie. You know what I mean? And then that's that's the way we'll know. But no, I did not know about that one. And and they had a they had a pretty good thing going for quite a while. Kevin Costner spent some time with us a couple of days ago where we touched on a variety of things. He's been in so many great movies, a legitimate movie star. And uh, I was able to ask him, do you know how this uh, second part starts here? Uh, do you guys, uh, we start yeah. with them, um, you guys asking a question, right? So uh, more with Kevin and the Danettes got a chance to ask Kevin Costner questions. The Danettes would like to uh, ask you a question. We'll get to your movie as well. We got Kevin Costner here in the man cave. All right, one question each. And uh, these haven't been prior approval by me, so don't embarrass me here. <laughs> Seton, go first. Is it uh, more difficult for you to make a movie or write an album and record? Uh, you know? The album is, is harder. I, I really depend on my bandmates, and we co-write, and I write, and a lot of times my songs. I, what it is in my band, I break all the ties. I decided what I was going to do, and it was my, my it's same thing here. My deal to do it, and um, and the re reality is because of sports, I make sure the cream gets to the top, and often it's not my song. Uh, so uh, making a movie is is easier for me. I couldn't make a whole album. I don't think that it, that would add up to anything if I had to do it by myself. By the way, we had Dennis Quaid in a couple of weeks ago. He said you guys battled for roles. In your careers, we did. I think you know. There's, you know, the, you know, we're white guys. We're about six feet, 
Um, you know, let's face it. Let's break it down to what it really is. You know, there's these things. I mean, when I was trying to actually get into the business, I told you at the top that I wasn't 28 till I got that first check. So who was sitting in front of me? Didn't even have my. It was Mel Gibson. It was it was Richard Gere. It was Michael Pere. It was Ken Wall. It was Sean Penn, Timothy Hutton, and and I, you know, Nicholas. I was thinking, well, there's not going to be room, and I just, I just kept on. You know, I just kept on, and there was a moment in time I thought it will be very difficult to jump because their resumes are getting bigger, and might still a big, a big goose egg, man. Paulie, you're a question for Kev. I want to ask you about Night Shift that you were an extra in one of my favorite movies, but we're not going to go there because it's if you were on a desert island, had a. I'm going to tell you, you get two questions. Okay, but uh, uh, <laughs> oh, it, it was a Night Shift you were just saying. You, weren't you an extra in yeah, Night yeah, Shift? Yeah, I was Kevin? an extra. Yeah, so I don't need to answer that. Dumb, dumb thing. Come on. <laughs> All right, if you were on a desert <laughs> island, and if you were on a desert island for the rest of your life and had to bring one of your own movies, and that's the only thing you could watch, what would you bring of your movies? Uh, it might be um, uh, Open Range. Uh, um, you know, I didn't really understand right away, Danny, when you said, what do they say to you out there? But one of the things I get, like, from real high up, Kevin, make a, make a, make a, make a, make a Western. <laughs> We need another Western. <laughs> well, that's what they want, huh? That's what they want. That's what they want. All right. Were you in that bathtub? Were you in that bathtub with Sarandon? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was. <laughs> Were you in that bathtub? I said I was. Okay. He was in it. Did you get more publicity from the big chill by not really being in it? I than, did. Than if you would have been the body, the cadaver there? And, then, you know, that was my decision to not do press. In fact, there was a big movement for me to do press. They said, Jesus, this movie's taken off. You were in that movie. This is time to capitalize. And I just felt like, no, I'm going to have my moment, and I got a feeling it'll be more interesting when I do. In fact, some guy wrote a very scathing thing of me in Boston and said, you know, I tried to find this Kevin Costner, and he did a, it was like a, two paragraph thing, three, four. And he did a, a time, time, time where for four days, he tried to get a hold of me and he goes, and the guy wouldn't talk to me. He's not going to be nothing. But he went after me because of, I wouldn't talk about the movie that I wasn't in. Well, you, you're dead. Yeah. Like you're, I it, wasn't, it's a, you don't, it's a sports they thing. They don't it's, even show your face. Look, it's a sports thing. Yeah. You don't go, you, I wasn't on the team. <laughs> you know, it's like when a guy's injured, it's really hard to take your world series ring. You, you <laughs> know, you're on the team, but you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's hard to take that ring. I mean, the, 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 the Cowboys are going to having a, a good thing. Where do they go? I don't know. That would be a hard ring for Tony. Tony Romo? To, to, put, to put on, because he's been such an important part of that franchise, and he deserves it. But him as a player, knowing that he's still a player, you knowing he's a really good player, yeah. that ring won't mean as much to him because you know you got to play. Uh, I want to talk about the movie. It's Hidden Figures. It's in um, theaters January 6th. You're Al Harrison, director of uh, NASA's space program. Yeah. And you have three African American women who were at NASA at the time, yeah. and they're helping put John Glenn into orbit. Yeah, what happens is, you know, one of the charming things about it. Can you say charming in a mat cat in a man cave? Yeah, I don't think you can. It feels a little weak, doesn't it? But you know, one of the, the things that caught me when I started reading the script, because keep in mind, I read these scripts, and no one else knows what. The, when I read Field of Dreams, no one else knew what this movie was. I read it on my couch, and I thought. I got a secret. I, you know, and I go Bull Durham, like, I got a secret. I read these certain movies and I go, I think this movie can live for a long, long time. When I started reading Hidden Figures, it, it dawned on me in one of the first scenes or so that the people that did the math were called computers. Long before your computers, mm -hmm. they, were, they, had, they, they had that name. That's how they were uh, referred to. So I thought that was an interesting little piece of business. But you know, I didn't know this story, uh, and I think probably without, you know, getting so far into the movie, this we're talking about really gifted people. We're talking about the girls you wanted to sit next to in school, up and to your left so you could maybe see. Their uh, paper. Their paper. Yeah. You know, they usually hold them off. <laughs> but um, I guess one of the really, the thing about NASA, the thing about this country, the thing about sports, and I go back to sports a lot, is that we're the cream's supposed to get to the top. Best player's supposed to play. Uh, there's no economic thing going on here. 
And in the case of Hidden Figures, these women were really smart. And one of them was so smart that when John Glenn, who we all know about because of history, says, I'm not going unless the girl says I can go. And I go, which girl? And he goes, the, the girl. I said, which girl? He goes, the smart girl. Not the black girl, not the cute one, not the white one, not the smart one. And the idea that the cream got to the top and John Glenn would get in that capsule and go and put his life on the line for some girl who did it longhand. Those kind of things I like. And you got, the cast is great. Yeah. I mean, these women are great. You got big names to be in this movie. Yeah, Octavia did Black or White with me, and so she was uh, you know, always fun for me. to Taraj A. Henson? Yes, exactly. You know, Janelle Monae? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at you. What's next after this? I gotta make a western. <laughs> an an effing <laughs> western, Kevin. And maybe get back in the tub with Sarandon. Yeah, yeah. Were you in the tub? <laughs> He said, look, I can't, kiss and, I can't kiss and tell right here in New York, okay? The movie that your kids love watching, is there one that stands out that your kids... Yeah, um, it's a mixed bag for my older set. I have, you know, I've got 30, 29, 28, 9, 6, and, and uh, 7. Um, the older they like, ones. They like Fandango. Um, you know, they like... Uh, um, they like Perfect World. So it's a that's a mixed bag there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever stop by and just watch your own movie? When's the last no. time you did it? No. I, accidentally? Uh, accidentally, yeah. And, uh, you know, the dog hears it before I do. <laughs> the dog hears your yeah, voice? Yeah, it knows the voice. The dog hears it before I do. It's the truth. It's the truth. Uh, well, good luck with the movie. Thank it's you. It's great to have you in the man cave. We didn't get the last two questions. Uh, all right, McLovin, your question. I swear, I'm not making this up. You stole my big chill question, but I was just going to state that Fandango is underrated. Love that movie. Yeah. All right. But wait, how did you find out you weren't in Big Chill, by the way? Were you watching The it? director called me and he said, look, this has happened sometimes. It's the way I'm looking at it, and it's not going to make it. But he says, I'm going to make this up to you, and I'm going to put you in a Western, Silverado. He didn't, he didn't know the movie he was going to make at that time, but that's a sports guy. I'm going to make it up to you. I like it. I'm going to make it up to you. And it's like you go, and, you know, so I didn't wilt like a daisy. I wasn't, I didn't feel bad. I felt like that was an honorable thing, a very difficult phone call. But I knew my career started with that movie, regardless of whether I, I appeared in it or not. And you, you need to kind of know what the moments are in your life, whether the world gets to see it or not. You know when the shoe drops and you think you're on your way. And I was on my way when I did that movie. Fritzy, final question. Movie role you didn't get that devastated you the most and the role you most regret passing on that you yeah. did get. I, uh, I really wanted to do um, um, uh, Schindler's List. Uh, I thought for a moment I wanted to direct it. It wasn't going to be directed at first. I was told that S Stephen wasn't going to direct it. I went after it. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, I talked to Steve and he goes, I, I think it needs work. I said, I think it's really perfect. He goes, well, I, I think it needs a little bit more. And then he ended up directing it. And, you know, he did a, a really beautiful job. But I, I said, well, I'd still like to play Oscar Schindler. Ooh. And, um, and uh, he said, well, I, you know, I'm, I said, could I read for it? And I've never told this story, okay? This has never been told ever. And, um, and I said, and he goes, well, I'm thinking, I said, Look it, I'll fly out and I'll read for you. So I got a, a bald cap and um, I came and I came to his apartment uh, up in the kitchen. He had a little camera and I tried to play Oscar Schindler for him. I auditioned for him because I wanted to be in it. I felt like it was a really important movie and I didn't get it. Liam um, Neeson got it. And, um, but I, I tell that story simply because you know, whatever actor, whatever people think your position is in the world, when you want something, you humble yourself and you go out and get it. You know, you don't kowtow to anybody, but it's not too much of me to go put on a ball cap and say, I can play this guy. I didn't get that. So a lot of people think, well, dumb move flying across the country, kind of humiliating, wasn't it? Uh, I don't see it that way. So um, that's, a, that's a true story in his kitchen here in New York. And I walked out thinking, man, I'm a dumb <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But you know what? I thought, I thought, you know, in sports, you go and you try it and you walk on. And there are people that don't develop in high school, don't even develop 
in college and they're playing in the pros. Well, you have to get to the plate to get a hit. Yeah. So you went to the plate. You go to Spielberg's apartment. Yeah. You, you, you took your cuts. Yeah. I wanted to direct it. I wanted to act in it. I just worked myself right out of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> the movie is Hidden Figures. Kevin Costner plays Al Harrison, director of the NASA Space Program in theaters January 6th. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.